It gives me great pleasure to welcome Effie Rensu uh, from Princeton, who's visiting us today. Um, Effie is an associate professor of French and Italian uh, literatures in the department. Well, sorry, she's, she's not the professor of Italian, but she's in the Italian and French department at Princeton University. Uh, she studies modernist and avant-garde literature and art, uh, and particularly poetics, the relation between the imaging text the social analysis of literature, uh, the politics of literary production, and the internationalization of experimental avant-garde. <coughs> uh, her first book, uh, entitled Literature malgré elle, Le Surréalisme de la Transformation du Littéraire, came out in 2010. And that book examines the construction of literary phenomena in the production of an anti-literary movement, Surrealism, which she studies both in its Greek context and in its French context. Uh, another one of her notable achievements was, was this terrific exhibition she helped curate um, at the uh, Princeton Museum uh, called 1913, The Year of Modernism, which went along with a conference that she also co-organized um, that was in 2013, the centenary of this watershed year uh, in modernism. And she's currently working on a second book entitled The Moment, Concepts of the World, Avant-Garde, and the Idea of the International. And a book this book explores the conceptualization of the world <coughs> the of uh, writers and artists with and around the historic avant-garde, let's say, futurism, Dada, and surrealism in particular. Her talk today, which relates to this work, is called Beyond the Human, Universalism, Humanism, and the 1930s French Avant-Garde. Please join me in welcoming everyone Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for having me here. This is my first uh, time here. I'm delighted. Um, and before I start, I would like just to say a couple of things about how this paper, what I'm going to present today, actually is integrated in the project that uh, Jonathan just presented. So this book uh, about um, uh, the historical avant-garde in France and the idea of the world. So what I try to do in the book is to explore different conceptions of the world, of the international, as they were expressed in specific works and as they were inf informed by broader political, social, and cultural dynamics of the period between the two world wars. My point of departure for that project, for this book, um, uh, is the simple and generally accepted assumption that the movements of the historical avant-garde were very self-consciously international and that they spread in many different countries. I'm thus interested in showing how literary production and cultural interpretation are informed by geographical space, both as fact but uh, also as topic of imagination. So I see the avant-garde and, and the larger movement of modernism to which it is joined as a heterogeneous whole that sometimes, in spite of itself, elaborated and in some sense imposed a worldwide perception of culture. So in this book I have uh, two chapters that are dedicated to the 1930s and the dominant avant-garde movement of the time, Surrealism. Surrealism was the movement with the widest international dissemination, but also the one with the most extensive theoretical elaboration of what constitutes the world, the international, articulated in clear political terms. Today, I would like to discuss with you one prominent manifestation of this elaboration, namely the magazine Minotaur, a collective, multi-voiced, dialogic, and multi-genre serial object, which offers, I argue, a universalist point of view on the world. Uh, I want to show uh, how this universalist project is a deeply political one that complicates and counteracts the anthropological humanism of its time, presenting a radical critique of the West. So, Minotaur, you see the cover of the first issue, the lavish art, literature, and culture magazine published by Swiss editor Albert Skira started publication in 1933, and by its last installment in 1939, it had produced 13 issues. During these six years, Minotaur, a thing of beauty, as James Clifford has put it, invested heavily in glossy presentation, impeccable and abundant reproductions of photographs and works of art in both black and white and color, and most importantly, commissioned each cover to an artist who interpreted especially for the magazine the figure of the Minotaur, like here with Picasso. All of this gave the magazine the appearance of an artist's scrapbook. The magazine was early on taken over by the Surrealist group, to whom Skira had given carte blanche to talk about anything except their political positions. There was only one forbidden word, révolution, the revolution. 
In this respect, Minotaur found itself in oddly diametrical opposition to the magazine that immediately preceded it, Le Surrealisme au service de la Révolution, you see it here, which between 1930 and 1933 deployed a political position subordinated to the French Communist Party and the directives of the Third International. This magazine here, along with uh, La Révolution Surréaliste, which was published between 1924 and 1929, framed the first 10 years of the movement's existence within a rhetoric of a generalized revolution announced on their cover and echoed in the content of every issue. With Minotaur, this project, both as a vision of the world and of its revolution, took a different turn. In the editorial in this first issue, Minotaur's project for modern art is succinctly described as a universalist one, and I'm going to quote in English from the editorial. Minotaur will publish first the production and works of artists of universal interest. That is to say, Minotaur will stand by its will to find, unite, and distill those elements that constitute the spirit of the modern movement in order to spread its influence. Minotaur, in an effort to update the artistic domain following an encyclopedic spirit, will commit to declutter it in order to give back to the art and movement its universal expansion. This aspiration to universality remained strong throughout Minotaur's run, further reinforced by the Surrealists, who were encouraged by the international enthusiastic reception of the magazine. The Surrealist editors declared their commitment to create a, I quote, universal organ truly modern, and une véritable revue d'actualité, a modern magazine that is current and relevant. I'm trying to translate from French the word actualité, which has this double meaning. This aspiration was often conflated with the enigmatic mythical Greek figure from which they borrowed their title, the Minotaur, who stood in editorials and articles as a cipher of universality, but also of what lies hidden beneath current events. The question that comes out from this very brief presentation of the general orientation of the magazine is whether the previous surrealist worldview implied by internationalism and its revolutionary aspirations has given way to some kind of generic universalism. Has the revolution been diluted and thinly layered upon the glossy surface of this thing of beauty? Is the surrealist estrangement from the Communist Party a sufficient explanation for their turn to an apolitical forum in which benign references to zoomorphic myths, the Minotaur, had replaced the hope for a generalized political revolution? Is it, however, plausible to accept that during a period marked by heightened political activity, um, the surrealists abandoned all political aspiration? In other words, within a movement that was, politically speaking, remarkably consistent and continuous for all its diversity, could there be a link between the revolutions announced in the 20s and the hybrid animal man of the 30s? Retracing the movement steps back towards La Révolution Surréaliste might offer an alternative entryway into the project of Minotaur. Already in this title, La Révolution Surréaliste is positioned as the organ of the revolution to come, while the content fleshes out this revolution by taking aim at various institutions, from the Pope to the university, but mainly by taking aim at Europe, um, as the quintessential expression of what surrealism stands against. And I quote, Bloodless Europe, queen of cadaverous bourgeoisie and of bastardized proletariats, what can you offer us? This is a question asked in a short anonymous article with the title Europe in 1926. The partial answer to this rhetorical question is, and I quote again, we only have but one hope, the distant flow of barbarian peoples on the decomposed cadaver of the West. So these barbarians will make the revolution happen and the Orient becomes, through many articles in the magazine, this magazine, an imaginary virtual space created for and by the revolution to come. This space is opposed to Europe and to the civilization and values of the West, based on a classical, mainly Greek culture, by virtue of its barbarism. Denis Ollier rightly notes that this use of the Orient as a reverse Orientalist trope establishes an East versus West binary that is almost void of content, making Orient's alterity into a negative print of the West. This imaginary and stereotypical nature of the Orient is not downplayed by the Surrealists, however, who are very conscious of their use of it as a topos, but also of its limits. 
André Prétenon, leader of the movement, in another article in the magazine, notes that, and I quote, the Orient is everywhere. It represents the conflict of metaphysics with its enemies who are the enemies of freedom and of contemplation. In Europe even, who can tell where the Orient is not? So the Surrealist Revolution was centered in the 20s upon an imaginary Orient, an anti-Europe that also implied an anti-Greece, each of which stands in its amorphous homogeneity as a metonymy for universal upheaval and revolt. Already in the 20s, this position was deemed to be at best idealist and at the worst naive and even dangerous without any real political heft. The attack on the West and the cult of barbarism, however, goes beyond any simplistic critique of capitalism and certainly goes beyond the creation of a new social and political myth. It aims its lances, rather, at the heart of a humanist tradition that places a Greek perception of the human at its center, thus creating the hierarchies and cleavages that lie at the foundation of Western hegemony in the world. The elements laid out in La Révolution Surréaliste in an unambiguously political framework as part of a crucial equation for revolt, that is, Europe and its others, civilization and barbarism, are thus also framed by an implicit evaluation of the human. Indeed, on the cover of the first issue of La Révolution Surréaliste that you see here, one sentence stands out as a demand promise and program, and is the sentence in the triangle formed by the photographs. Il faut aboutir à une nouvelle déclaration des droits de l'homme. We must reach to a new declaration of the rights of man. The nod to the French Revolution is obvious in its aspiration to make the Surrealist Revolution a continuation or a rejuvenation of its message. The reference specifically to the rights of man, however, shows a preoccupation not only with refounding rights, but with refounding man. André Breton will later comment, uh, comment on this uh, mot d'ordre by giving it the dimensions of a radical critique of reason, a critique that, according to Breton, is best explained as follows, and I'm going to quote from Breton, this is from an interview that he gave on th in the 50s um, on this sentence there. To declare that reason is the essence of the human is already to cut the human in two, and the classical tradition always did that. This tradition distinguished within the human this that is reason and thus really human, and this that is not reason and seems thereafter to be unworthy of the human. So the new declaration of the rights of man implies a new definition of the human that goes beyond this classical tradition that Breton talks about. In other words, beyond the humanist tradition. Il faut aboutir à une nouvelle déclaration des droits de l'homme, taken at face value, programmatically frames the issue of man within the political realm, but also unsettles the basis of republican universalism. Rather than a declaration of universal rights, the weight shifts to declaration of the rights of universal men. Like the Rousseau's of the 20th century, the Surrealists saw the disjunction between the lack of freedom within the bourgeois, capitalist, Western society and the absolute freedom and liberation they had imagined and experienced as a group. The political project announced at the advent of Surrealism in this first issue of the La Révolution Surrealiste is essentially a daring reconsideration of a long-standing revolutionary post-Kantian question, what is man? This is a question that also echoes Kant's universalism, which as Nick Nesbitt, my colleague, points out, and I quote from his book, is linked to a descriptive anthropology of human difference and multiplicity, one that explicitly rejects the contingent empirical injustice of imperialism. Nesbitt's description of Kant's universal anthropology could indeed be aptly applied to the Surrealist project, and I quote, a Kantian anthropology of universal human creativity would point not only to the rare revolutionary moments that reconfigure human history, but to the often indiscernible micro-events that occur each day throughout human societies, moments in which the transcendental spontaneity of human imagination breaks free from the dominant state of things. It is precisely this human multiplicity, as well as its revolutionary potential, that is at the center of Minotaur as an elaboration in the 30s of the revolutionary aspiration to redraw the rights of men that first appear in the 20s in this magazine. So back to Minotaur. Indeed, in a seminal uh, article 
published in the ostensibly apolitical Minotaur in December 1934, the title of the article was La Grande Actualité Poétique, André Breton discusses the political function of poetry. There, his conclusion is that in the specific historical moment, meaning one of not violent upheaval and revolution, the fundamental political task of poetry is none other than the deepening of the human problem in all its forms and its resolution. This rare explicitly political statement finds its representational iteration in a series of articles and images throughout the run of the magazine that explore the human as a space of formal possibilities. And I'm just going to run a slideshow with <coughs> images from the 12 issues of the magazine that show precisely how all the different ways that they focused on the human body, uh, from photography to painting and so on. So I'm going to talk over it. The recurring element in these articles and images is the presentation of the human body not in its humanistic splendor and unique difference from the rest of the organic world, but instead as part of the organic world into which it might disappear any moment, undergoing endless combinations. The malleability, softness, and indeterminacy of the organic form, its openness to change, to decay, to regeneration, marks every single issue the human body and its real or fantastic variations lend a rhythm to the whole magazine. And it's no exaggeration to say that the human body becomes one of the magazine's organizing principles. Breton's call to resolve the problem of the human finds a response in this persistent return to the human figure, not for the elaboration of a type or a model, but rather as endless malleability and possibility. The 30s are generally marked by a turn to figuration, and specifically to the human body in the visual arts. However, the human body in Minotaur is far from the ideal neoclassical humanistic body that appears in the imagination and the art of the late 20s and 30s as a symptom of the return to order, retour à l'ordre. As Hal Foster remarks, reactions in the visual arts to the First World War's atrocious mutilations moved either towards a return to the human figure that entertained neoclassical nostalgic fictions of an intact body or towards machinic interpretations of the human body. However, what we see in Minotaur iconographically and theoretically is a third way, a return to the human figure that is neither intact nor neoclassical, neither a statue nor a machine. Instead, it is a figure that is extended, mutilated, recombined, demoted from its ideal forms, and most importantly, divorced altogether from the possibility of ideal form. What is striking about the construction of the human figure in Minotaur is that it goes against the avant-garde paradigm of the less human and deploys one of the more human. Mechanomorphized humans, automata, and mechanical prosthesis have all been readily associated with the avant-garde aesthetics in general and with surrealism in particular to virus effect. The bodies that pollulate in Minotaur tell a different story. Their multiplicity relies on the variability of the human form itself, and its fantastic iterations extend into the organic world rather than into the mechanic. It is not a man-machine that is constructed, but rather the collective construction of a polymorphous, polyvalent body, old, young, mutilated, extended, vegetal, animal, <laughs> twisted, stretched, chopped, multiplied. And I think I have a couple of more images before I move to my next set of images, so I will let it play out. You may recognize some of the artists. This move is perhaps most daringly illustrated in the concrete representations of animals in the magazine, representations that verge on the creation of an alternative ethnography <coughs> as a mode of inquiry into the human and its limits. And again, I'm going to run um, a series of images with animals as they appear in the magazine. To this effect, the animal in the magazine is not a human in reverse. Throughout Minotaur, human and animal experiment with different relations, different possible positions with respect to each other, ranging from the juxtaposition and the symbiosis of the two within the Minotaur itself, to animalized visions of the human, like here, uh, the Minotaur's head composed by a woman's torso. This was a photograph by Man Ray. Minotaur 
does not provide a definitive answer as to how to stop once and for all what Giorgio Agamben calls the anthropological machine that has sustained an image of the human as the conqueror of the animal first and foremost within himself. But it provides glimpses of a situation in which the smooth functioning of this machine might be sabotaged, showing the possibility of a different configuration of the human outside the dichotomies that underlie and support our civiliz civilization. It is the very question of man and of humanism that must be posed in a new way, claims Agamben, and Minotaur seems to have done exactly that. This operation is in fact emblematically captured on the covers of the magazine, which feature different representations of the Minotaur, a human animal. Each artist reconfigures the monster's clashing parts and thus its monstrosi monstrosity. Dallas Minotaur, for instance, is a woman with the head of a bull and a lobster crawling out of a hole in her stomach. Her body has hollow niches, as you can see, for various objects, and her breasts are replaced by a drawer. The objects dug into the female minotaur do not create the impression of a commodified body, but rather of an uncategorizable figure of corporeal possibilities whose organic characters affect the environment around it. Notice, for instance, that what looks like pillars, pillars of Greek columns around the minotaur um, have completely lost their rigidity and their architectural form, and they have become almost organic. It's as if the minotaur's or organicity just spreads out to the environment. Um, so again, I'm, I'm going to run um, uh, images with all the covers of all the artists. By constantly remaking the unyielding materiality of the human-animal hybrid, hybrid, the covers, in synergy with the title, sum up the program of the whole magazine. The visu visual figuration of the monster informs the visual treatment of the human. Experimenting, experimenting with the unruly body of the minotaur by reinventing it for each issue, according to the visual vocabulary of each artist, opens up a space for similar restructuring of the human body. The color covers an aesthetic delight for the reader, set the conceptual tone for the rest. From the monster to the human, the figure that results can be described in Deleuze and Gattari terms as a corps sans organe. It is a body not without organs per se, but rather without organism that resists organization, both physical and social, a body that is constantly reinvented, a body of potentialities, a non-hierarchical body. The human body as a virtuality that defies organization and hierarchical structure is an anarchic construction of imminence, open to intensities and becomings. It is a body open to, and I quote from Deleuze, connections, circuits, conjunctions, levels and thresholds, passages and distributions of intensity. This reconfigured human body resists physical organization, as the many instances of the Minotaur show. Even this archetypical monster is unarchetypical, multiple, unstable and decentered. The human body becomes, like the body of the monster, the terrain of experimentation, of assemblage, physical, but possibly also social and political. André Breton's call for resolution of the problem of the human as a political issue finds thus a, prelim a preliminary visual response in the elaboration of the figure of the monster. Is this the new declaration of the rights of man? One should remember that during this specific time period, the perfect classical body was overwhelmingly appropriated by the totalitarian ideologies of Europe. The Nazi and fascist discourses and aesthetics, inspired largely by the Greek paradigm, projected the image of the ideal man in the athletic and harmonious splendor of the Greek statuary. The body featured during the same period in the Greek-inspired magazine Minotaur, and also, I should say, in Georges Bataille, Greek-inspired Acephal. This is the cover by André Masson, and the images that you will see are also by André Masson. So these bodies in Minotaur and Acephal, um, this body is situated far from this intact perfection associated with classical antiquity and manipulated to elevate totalitarian regimes. Instead, the human Greek body presented in the avant-garde publications is altered, mutil mutilated, hybridized, transformed. If the athletic perfection of the Nazi body is a neoclassical reaction to the extreme violation of the body during the First World War, the mutilated and hybridized pre-classical bodies of the French avant-garde in the 30s seem to represent different ways of working through repressed images of les gueules cassées. 
instead of a sublimatory correction towards an ideal, they offer organic extensions or reassemblings of the human figure verging on the monstrous, that to be sure, rework aesthetic models, but chiefly rethink the human as organizing principle of the world as universal value. And I have put side by side some images from Minotaur and some of the um, uh, na Nazi statuary of the time. The advantage of visuality for universalist perspectives um, has not been missed by the avant-garde. Various iterations of abstraction, for instance, have been understood as elements of a universal language that would transcend national and cultural frontiers. Kazimir Malevich's uh, simple suprematist vocabulary or Hans Richter's abstract films were conceived as an antidote to national languages and misunderstandings. There, it is a radical break from figuration, a departure from the human, and an attachment to the perfect geometric forms that would ensure universality. These avant-garde universalist dreams restate visually the Enlightenment belief in the universality of reason, and the hope for a perfect language for all, trying to, to eradicate the possibility of error. The surrealist visual universalism of Minotaur goes in a different direction and instates the human body in its materiality, real or imagined, actual or possible, multiple and polymorphic, as a universal language. And this language is not perfect. In fact, it is always imperfect and unfinished. Minotaur not only accomplishes the remaking of the human figure as an organic body that defies classical notions of perfection and wholeness, but does so by subverting the Greek in its universality, keeping Greek as a general category along with its function standing in for the universal human. The French avant-garde coalescing around this magazine rewrites the foundations of Western humanism by changing the content of this word. To the then totalitarian Greek classical human that becomes a model functioning on the basis of exclusion, of the deformed, of the non-Aryan, of the deviant body, with the tragic consequences few years later with the mass extermination of, uh, of those who were not human enough, the avant-garde opposes a Greek human as a body without organs, meaning non-hierarchical, one that includes the possibility of a virtual other, a figure of universal inclusion, even of the object. The surrealists thus accomplish a virtuoso gesture, while upon the image of Greece, a solid base of humanism, a universal worldview had been built around the centrality of the human. The surrealists managed to retool our cultural experience of ourselves through the very same image, so as to actuate a decenter consideration of the human. The universalist project of Minotaur is one that cuts through Western humanism by undoing its Greek core, it keeps the category of the human, but constructs it as a continuous difference. The homo universalis becomes a monstrum universale. In this sense, more than taking an anti-humanist stance, Minotaur, together with other surrealist endeavors of the time, puts forth a non-anthropocentric humanism that aspires to the same universality as humanist Greece had, but by avoiding the idea of a homogeneous, exceptional, and superior human being. This universalism tries to undo Western thought and its hegemony at its very kernel, its conception of the human. Etienne Balibar, commenting on the clash between real universality as a process of globalization and universalism as it was conceived in Western history, calls for an alternative, ambiguous universality that accepts, and I quote, the scattered meaning of the universal and its diverse modalities that seek articulation. Minotaur, was an early response to similar clashes and proposed, indeed, an alternative universalism in which it is the anthropos that stands as a universal ambiguity. Thank you. Thanks very much, Evie. Uh, just to start things off, I've got a question that I, I think fits your terms, uh, but with another kind of emphasis, which is the marvelous features, I think there's more than one, I love this one, Picasso, of the artist in his studio. Yes. It's his, I think, in mm -hmm. all cases here, that's maybe, or maybe incidental or not. But uh, with regards to this idea of the, the Minotaur not just being a kind of counter, counter classical mythological figure, but actually the figure of the labyrinth, mm -hmm. and you think about the, that, that acephal figure, right, of the, of, as having no head, but also sort of this, the, the, the labyrinth of the, of the bowels. Mm -hmm. um, 
that 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 becomes the place where the work happens. Mm -hmm. you know, right? The, in the in the work of rumination, as opposed to activism uh, in the kind of underground, as opposed to mm -hmm. um, in the clean lines of classicism. Um, I'm wondering the extent to which another way to to to, to, to see a through line through Minato um, can be not just the the role of the kind of morphology in the in, in figuration, but actually also of a process. I mean, thinking about the artist studio, mm -hmm. right, is a place where figuration happens. Mm -hmm. right? and, and thinking about uh, you know, the, the role of ethnography and, and of, of practice and the traces of that practice. Mm -hmm. There's palmistry, there's criminology, right, there's uh, all these other kinds of or dance, right, all, all these other things about mirroring and simulation, um, animal, animal mimicry and so mm -hmm. forth. The, the vocabulary and syntax of praxis mm -hmm. That occupies a similar sweep mm -hmm. across the not only the, lo the, the the human world but uh, the, the, the vegetal world and mineral world as well. Um, you know, it seems to be in line with the, with, this, with the birth of structuralism as an ethnographic practice. And I'm wondering if you could just say a bit about the way in which that that order of of, of activity um, also constitutes a, a, a shift in the nature of, of humanism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are six questions in there, so I would just uh, pick and choose. Yes, indeed, that was Picasso's studio. So um, uh, the magazine commissioned a series of photographs in Picasso's studio with emphasis to uh, the um, uh, three-dimensional objects that he was making. And uh, you're right to say that throughout the magazine there's a lot of emphasis on um, the process of making. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in one of the images um, you could see the palm prints of uh, writers and artists and musicians and there are six or seven pages of these prints of hands. So there is this insistence of the hand as the making. This is the, the, the hands of the artist that, um, uh, that makes something. And you're right to point out that the labyrinth in which the Minotaur of course finds himself uh, is a kind of metaphor of this process, of this artistic uh, process. Um, and the articles, uh, some of the articles talk a lot uh, about uh, the process of how, um, how, how we create something, what it means to create something, what it means to write, uh, how we can uh, create new forms of art. I'm thinking of, uh, for example, of an article by Salvador Dali when um, he elaborates for the first time uh, his idea of uh, an être objet of a, a, a being object uh, that will be a kind of culmination of the surrealist uh, object. So there is all this emphasis there. Uh, on the one hand, um, the first reflex is to say that this comes out of ethnographic practices and um, an ethnographic tradition that by then had you know, 20 years of uh, existence. And uh, the subtitle of the magazine actually uh, includes ethnology, not ethnography. The second issue of the magazine was entirely uh, dedicated to the uh, big ethnographic mission organized by the French colonial state. It was the mission Dagar Djibouti, so it functioned almost as a catalog for the exhibition that was put together in the Musée de l'Homme with uh, things that were brought from the exhibition. But then something weird happens with ethnography. You have all the second issue that I the whole thing is ethnographic and then ethnography just disappears completely. It com comes back at the last issue with an article by Seligman, we were discussing Seligman yesterday, um, which is a very weird article because it is an uh, interview with a Native American from the Northwest. But in this interview, the ethnographer Seligman and um, the Native American switch positions. And it is the Native American who starts asking the ethnographer questions as if the ethnographer is a specimen. So um, uh, in that sense, there is a reflection, I think, throughout the magazine, even about the practice, uh, uh, ethnography as a practice, to what extent uh, what we thought would open up the West towards the rest of the world, in fact, is another way of the West to impose itself on the rest of the world. And I think it, this is one of the reasons why ethnographic articles per se are eclipsed throughout the magazine after the second is issue, and then they come back as a reverse, reverse ethnography. And the only other uh, moment where you see ethnography as a practice is, weirdly enough, when there are all these articles about animals. So the animals, the articles about animals, uh, most of them are written in an ethnographic style. It, it is uh, as the, it's not ethology, but it's actually an ethnographer who observes the communities of animals.
Um, so process is very important. Labyrinth starts for th uh, stands for this process. Um, ethnography makes them think about process, but at the same time they reject it uh, for various re reasons, mainly I think political reasons uh, that I explained before. I don't know what else to address in your questions no. because you had a couple <laughs> of other things in there. Okay. Thank you for this fascinating talk. Uh, I was really struck by the way you called attention to the poetic significance of the Minotaur as an image of, as you put it, endless malleability and mm -hmm. possibility of the uh, more, not less, human form, the multiplicity and variability of the human form. But I'm also interested, um, I guess, in hearing you talk about the way in which the Minotaur figures as an image of self-negation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, a figure always awaiting the arrival of Theseus, mm -hmm. right, if you're kind of doomed in advance. Um, and whether or not that idea of self-negation, monstrous or otherwise, um, ties into the Deleuzian idea, <coughs> not so much of the body without organs, although maybe it could be linked up to that, to the Deleuzian idea of becoming animal, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which seemed to link up um, the juxtaposition of images that were shown in the talk. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Um, uh, this whole becoming animal is actually part of the chapter, but I, you know, I, I cut parts of this, but I, I totally agree with you. Um, what you point out is actually fascinating because uh, about the Minotaur as a, uh, as a figure of self-negation, always waiting for a slayer uh, to die. Uh, because in none of the occurrences of Minotaur in there, there is any Theseus. So Minotaur exists in uh, the labyrinth and he is the master of the universe and there's no thesis to be seen coming from Athens to kill him. Uh, so there's a suspension of the myth in this specific moment. Uh, however, we know the myth and we know what happened so that makes me think that you know uh, there maybe there is in there this idea of this project as a doom project so we're trying to maintain this moment we're trying to maintain uh, the, f the figure of the minotaur as a figure of becoming as you said as an anarchic figure of possibilities for what the human is but we know that it's a doom project because Theseus will come and will kill him uh, but that never comes in there. So they have chosen this specific moment uh, in this mythic uh, cycle and they only focus on that. Theseus just disappears. Um, others have focused on other moments. Um, uh, for instance, uh, the minion cycle of around the labyrinth and um, the Minotaur is very popular at the time because um, actually the digs from Crete have just been published. Uh, Knossos has been discovered a couple of decades before, but the publication is very recent. Uh, so there's a surge in interest uh, around uh, this mythological cycle uh, along many, many artists, from De Chirico early on with his series of Ariadne, who's left in Naxos uh, after uh, she leaves uh, Crete, uh, to um, different permutations of the labyrinth and so on. But, uh, you know, for them it's this specific suspended moment where Minotaur is hidden in there and uh, has all these interesting things going on. Yeah, there's a thread of your argument that I just want to pick up on, and this is, you know, obviously uh, following your comment about the Gambin and me inventing the human, requirement to reinvent the human. I mean, wanting a Gambin always is it's his own universalism, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and when I look at these images, I have questions about gender and race. Yeah. So for, the, for, the, for the purposes of this question, I just want to focus on gender. Mm -hmm. So my problem is that if you have the human, you have a universalist humanism, you also have um, difficulty with the notion that everything abject then questions that humanism, because then you get a universalism of the abject. Mm -hmm. right? So my specific question is if you would talk a little bit about the gendering of these animalized bodies, you know, if I look at this Minotaur, this to me is clearly a masculine yeah, right. rendering, whereas if we look at um, Lobster Lady, we've mm -hmm. got the feminine mm -hmm. rendering of, or, of it. And so I'm just wondering if you could read gender back into mm -hmm. the argument that you've been making, because it seems to have disappeared. Yes, no, you're, 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 you're absolutely and, uh, right. It bothers, I have to be honest, it bothers me. Yes. I don't want to go to a universalism of either the animalistic or the abject in order to undo the universalism of humanism because that don't work. <laughs> this is an open question whether this works or, or not. Uh, the question of, ge of gender uh, is a very important one and very thorny. 
uh, within surrealism. Mm -hmm. uh, so the prevalent uh, critical rhetoric uh, about surrealism, especially in art, uh, is that uh, it vi I mean, routinely it is misogynistic, uh, violence on human bodies, and uh, so on. Uh, what we see in the 30s, specifically in the 30s, where you have a lot of women artists who come uh, into the movement, and this is the first time that you have so many women in the movement. Uh, throughout the 20s, there were just men and their wives. But in the 30s, you have all these uh, writers and artists who are very active within the movement. Um, and what you will see bit by bit in Minotaur, and you see it throughout its run, so from 1933 to 1939, is a different magazine, um, is that while most of the images of uh, human bodies are female bodies, um, uh, you see more and more male and female bodies that uh, share equal roles. What do I mean by that? Um, you have a lot of images of gender neutral, uh, for instance, bodies, bodies that are uh, female and male at the same time. And androgyny is something that interests them very much. So how do you go beyond gender? How you can uh, create um, other conceptions of the human that is not gendered? Um, to my mind, there are more images of uh, women bodies because it is a genre. I mean, in uh, traditional painting, when you have a nude, it is 90% of uh, the cases is a woman is not a man. So if you're also trying to recreate or to attack a prevalent tradition, uh, you work with the themes of this uh, tradition. Um, I have to say that uh, in this whole theoretical and visual elaboration of what is the human, uh, in the theoretical text, so in the, in the articles that are in there, very little is actually said about the gender division. Is this universal human a man or a woman? Uh, do we have to think about the woman as an excluded entity in this universalism? Very little is said explicitly uh, about this. However, what is implicit is that very often this new all-inclusive human that can be perfect and imperfect takes the image of a woman, not always, but very, very often. Um, so they do go to instances that goes beyond the biological human, male or female. So they do go towards the animal, they do go towards the object, but they uh, they yeah, do go. Also yeah, they, there's no discussion about gender. Of well, there is some discussion sometimes when they uh, talk about mating habits, uh, for instance, uh, of uh, of some uh, of some animals. Uh, the praying mantis, yes, or uh, uh, when they talk about the families of um, uh, um, Shwet, of owls, yes. Um, so, uh, what are we saying? No, that's okay. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm just asking you to reflect, I guess, on yeah. some of the, the things that the posthuman tries to take into account. Yeah. Because you seem to be heading towards a posthuman argument, but with quite a radical absence of gender. It is because at this specific moment, they're much more um, interested in, um, uh, for instance, is a mutilated human body still human? Uh, is a human body that actually somehow by a magical way is hybridized with an object still human? Where does the human stop? and uh, where does it start? And um, I, I find that in the specific moment, 1938, let's say, as a generic uh, date, is a very poignant question because uh, on the other side of, 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 uh, of Europe, these questions will cost lives. But who is human and who is not? Who, where does mutilation actually takes away your humanity or what other criteria? And they go very deep uh, in that. Later, after the war, they will come back with a vengeance to the question of the gender. But um, I think Jonathan is better equipped to answer this question. But uh, they, they, they don't reflect so much on what are the limits of uh, the human. And there, the gender uh, enters into the discussion. I don't know whether you agree with that description or not. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and feminist critique, but I was also thinking of 
uh, pay payments uh, unmarked. And mm -hmm. now, like this idea that, I mean, it's not something she invented, but, um, um, you know, sh she's sort of, she comes up through discussions of this, that anybody, anybody that is not um, a white, uh, heterosexual, mm -hmm. male, um, Christian, Western body is marked by its gender, mm -hmm. its um, uh, race, or um, you know religion. Mm -hmm. or, you know we can extend this list, and similarly, you know disability or mm -hmm. um, different formations. So um, you know I, I feel like you know I can't completely articulate it right now, but I feel like you know, these parallels are also already there. Yes, I mean, uh, they are very conscious that they're white Western males and that they are in this dominant position. And they don't really like it, they don't really know how to articulate it yet, uh, and they try to find ways to counteract it. Uh, whether they're effective in that or theoretically um, uh, you know, sophisticated enough uh, to actually address the issues that uh, you uh, both talked about is a different question. But they have this unease. Uh, and even with practices as ethnography that uh, we talked about before, they are supposed to you know, open up uh, this kind of privilege of the West, they understand that they're still within this privilege. Uh, so they understand a lot of things, but they don't clearly uh, articulate them uh, always. Uh, they become more articulate about gender issues again in the 50s after the war than at this moment. And also this is very, this is the 30s, this is quite early. I was really excited when you showed the Dolly picture and talked about, you know, how it's creating it's sort of this uncharacterizable body that affects the world around it, mm -hmm. and creating a new world out of what's there. But the problem is, you know, it's it's different from you know encountering something you've never seen before. It's it's still an assemblage of familiar objects, right? And those familiar objects come with their own valences mm -hmm. and their own assumptions that we use to put things together. It's like, you know, these points of familiarity. And mm -hmm. So another thing that we haven't talked about yet, and this is definitely lower stakes in the gender and race problem, is the classical influence. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about this duality, you know, of the, the mind, and that's not all of classics. That's not Homer, for example. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could talk more about their mm -hmm. awareness of, you know, the nuances that exist in ancient Right. Uh, first of all, what you pointed out that uh, on the one hand, uh, you have the creation of the unfamiliar out of very familiar uh, ingredients. This can be the perfect description of what surrealism tried to do. Um, so this is what they often did, for instance, with the surrealist objects. You take objects that are already out there and you just put them together in a way that creates something that is completely unfamiliar and surprising and makes you think about all this. What you point out about the classical tradition is paramount, and again, this is something that I didn't develop here, and you're absolutely right to say that what I said is not all Greece. It's a specific perception of what is Greece that is um, uh, identified with the classical period and also the interpretation of the classical period that was uh, prevalent at the time. This is not true anymore. I mean, this was not even true from Nietzsche, who saw other things in the Greek tradition that didn't have to do with reason uh, and this duality and the perfect human and so on. So uh, I'm referring when I'm talking about Greece, and that's why I keep doing this flying motion is because it is a perception of what is Greece as a classical, uh, you know, uh, a perfect image. Uh, what they do, and I didn't refer much to this here, is that precisely they go back into time. And here the influence of ethnography is paramount. So they go into pre-classical Greece. So they're very much interested, for instance, in archaic Greece. They're interested in the uh, Minoan civilization. Uh, so what is, th what is there before Greece? Uh, and very much influenced by what uh, ethnography has brought forth. They look at this pre-Greek Greece under this light of ethnography. So they look at this as not um, uh, you know, the, the, the um, kingdom of reason and light and harmony and so on and so forth, but something else. 
uh, and they tend to make dichotomies. So they say it's the exact opposite. Uh, and minot the, the minotaur, uh, the minotaur, actually um, uh, serves them precisely because of that. Uh, so in the scheme that we're discussing before, if Theseus is coming from Athens, uh, and what is going to be the classical perfection of Greece uh, kills the minotaur is because minotaur is all this other dark stuff that they identify with uh, pre-classical Greece. There is a trend uh, in archaeology uh, at, at this time to go back into time and this is the first time that actually digs bring out um, uh, big important monuments of pre-classical Greece. And going back to your question about the process is also archaeology um, that plays uh, a big role in their understanding of uh, art making as process. Maybe even more than ethnography at this point. But you're absolutely right. There, there are multiple Greeces and they go with one that is clearly pre-pre-classical. Well, the Surrealists, the Surrealists were very actively politically from the go. Um, they had a brief moment where they thought that they were going to align themselves with the Communist Party. This didn't work at all. <laughs> they had a huge uh, break with them. But they were generally on the left the whole time. And uh, together with whatever artistic and literary production <coughs> they had, they had very clear political action. For instance, an example, 1931, the big, 31 was the colonial exhibition, right? The big colonial exhibition in Paris, the only entities that actually said, don't go to the colonial exhibition. This is a dirty imperialist war, uh, and so on and so forth, were the communists and the surrealists were the only one to actually have an open political declaration about an event. This continues throughout the 30s. What happens with this magazine is that in 1933, the Surrealists find themselves without a magazine for various reasons. And then there is this guy who comes in Skira with a lot of money and say, okay, you can have this magazine. This is gonna be a very beautiful magazine. They wanted to compete with um, a prevalent art magazine of the time, Cahier d'Art, which was, I mean, it had exactly the same format. Um, the, uh, the way that they put together the images was very similar. Um, so, of course, the surrealist Breton himself jumped on the occasion. There was a lot of strife around that. So there was a lot of critique within the movement that you sell us out. This is a bourgeois publication. This is so expensive that no one of the people that we want to read it can actually read it. You know, you just became a mondain. So there was this reaction. And at the same time, there was this imposition from the editor that, you know, that's fine whatever you're doing with politics, but not in here, outside. So what I tried to show, I mean, the prevalent reading of Minotaur goes with the idea that this has nothing to do with politics. This is surrealism selling out. Uh, basically, and uh, becoming part of the establishment uh, and so on. And I, I do not think it is the case that there's still a, um, there's still politics in there, but it is politics that actually um, works through representation. It's the way that a, a novel, a literature, or a work of art uh, can channel politics without being a propaganda uh, work of art. Uh, in parallel with all this, as I said, there are other activities. They participate in demonstrations. They're very, very active at this point in the anti-fascist struggle, extremely active. So they identify at this specific point that the big enemy is fascism, and we have to do everything we can to stop them uh, because they anticipate what is going to happen. Um, and uh, in other um, manifestations, I mean, in other um, events of the time, in 1938, uh, the Surrealists organized a big international exhibition in Paris in which, again, uh, through representational means, not through theoretical propaganda or position text that say we are anti-fascist. In the way they put the exhibition together, you see that there is a political reflection about what is going on. So, in other words, what I want to say is that this magazine, in my view, has a political stance, but this political stance comes out not uh, clearly in position 
articles and declarations as it happened in the other two magazines, but in factions, it functions through representation. So through the way, um, what I just said, <laughs> or what I tried to say. <laughs> uh, can I follow up on that? Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the left, left position is very complicated in that period. And yeah. There's a flux that keeps changing. Uh, this magazine is found in 1933. Now, in yeah. 1934, we get the consecration of socialist realism. Mm -hmm. and the commentary uh, jumps on that. Uh, yeah. And tries to propagate it. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the local communist parties have to, have to uh, yeah. uh, deal with it. At the same time, uh, Stalin uh, uh, tries to bring more Western artists to Moscow and yeah. get them in touch with this, this uh, uh, cosmopolitan uh, uh, hodgepodge of uh, uh, leftist uh, new politics that's being cooked in, in Moscow. Um, uh, uh, that seems to affect what is what is uh, going on here, and seems to make it even more complicated for yeah. a political position apart from just being political. Yes. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Is the is the perfect follow up from your question in the article that I mentioned before, um, Breton's article in the magazine, which is the only more overtly political uh, article in the magazine, which reflects on what is the political, what is the function of poetry today at a moment when we don't have a revolution. This is not the French Revolution, this is not the Commune, this is not the October Revolution. So how can uh, poetry uh, reflect on politics and act, and act politically? The main aim that he has in this article is socialist realism. So he, he says that we have two options. Either we do what the Soviets did and we go towards a social realism, which is completely uninteresting, and we don't want to do that because we are artists and we're not interested in this. Or we go towards a different direction that will be experimental on the one hand, on the other hand still ha will have some political value. And the answer that he gives there is what I said before, the only way to do that is to reflect on the human. Uh, so retain some of the values, let's say, of the left, which is a uh, human, but at the same time not uh, give up the experimental aspect. So you're absolutely right. Uh, left politics changed a lot between 1933 and 1938, 39. Um, generally speaking, uh, again, with a lot of variations within the movement because different people have different affiliations and so on and so forth, so this is a very general umbrella statement. The surrealists are in the left. They are Trotsky sympathizers. Uh, Breton goes and meets Trotsky in Mexico. Mexico. The last issue of the magazine is dedicated to Mexico and the, there's a photograph of uh, Trotsky, the famous photograph of Trotsky and Diego Rivera and Breton. Uh, they hope to do something together. Uh, Trotsky is killed, Minotaur stops. So uh, this is the general position which they try to occupy. Uh, and at the same time they want to create an art that is revolutionary, that is not conflated with social realism, which they think that is dumb. Uh, and uh, that will continue experimentation, but will also have some kind of effect, uh, some kind of impact, uh, or some kind of reflection on the politics and society of the time. And maybe just want to mention also the, uh, the Kharkov conference. I mean, one of the great things, right, mm -hmm. is that, uh, <laughs> problematically, um, a number of the serials were actually asked for the Kharkov conference in mm -hmm. uh, 1932, and this created an enormous schism in the movement about how how that uh, reverberated through. So by 1933, that, that was already done. Mm -hmm. right? It was the movement of the idea of an independent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. art. Yeah, that yeah. That it's not propaganda, mm -hmm. but also not art for art's sake. Right. Really but it strikes me that there is something going on at this like, precise moment where there's a split between sort of formal experimentalism and overtly political work. Like overtly political work can't be formally experimental. You know, just yes, and, 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 they, and they disagree with that. They don't want to find themselves trapped in this either or. So they're trying to keep a position that no, we can be politically re relevant and at the same, same time experiment. They don't use the word formally or formalist because there's <laughs> There's not a lot of formalism, let's put it in this way, in surrealism. So they, they do, um, uh, one of the struggles is against precisely what you're saying. And um, Minotaur is one answer uh, of how we're trying to, there are other answers around this time, uh, collective answers, like in the exhibition that I mentioned before. Great work. Oh, okay. No, just, just to remind you of uh, 38 of the Which is precisely that. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I think that also around there is this notion in the tone that uh, the liberation has to come through a psychological, artistic liberation from the inside before it can be um, acted on. Or be, or be, or be, or be, or be. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I don't know whether I would, uh, I would agree with the um, um, chronological prioritization of both. It's not that, uh, you know, you have first to, you know, be liberated internally and be in touch with your unconscious so that, uh, but it's a process that happens at the same time and it cannot but happen at the same time. And actually the Romanian surrealists a little bit later were great in articulating precisely that, how the political revolution cannot but be also uh, some kind of revolution of consciousness uh, through a different understanding of the unconscious and so on. So they articulated very uh, nicely a couple of years later. So yes, they do believe that both are like this. I don't think that they think that first one has to happen and then the other, but they just go together. Thank you all very much for coming. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you.